dragons, right? So again, they end up using the word dragon for dinosaur. And again, dragon is the old word for that. So we talked about, again, the fact that dragons slash dinosaurs are in the Bible. God speaks of them and everything. And even tells Job that he made behemoth, which was probably a giant seropod dinosaur like this, that he made them on the same day, man and the dinosaurs. So if there's dinosaurs were created by God and live with man, is there any proof that that happened? Is there any proof that dinosaurs actually lived with people? Well, that's what we're going to look at today. And I already got the proof all we need right here. I got photographic evidence of somebody with a dinosaur. So, <laughs> so right there, there's all the proof we need that people live with dinosaurs, all right? So, but no, I actually took that on our first uh, trip to the Creation Museum many years ago over in Kentucky. It's a wonderful place if you haven't ever been, if you haven't been there. They're constantly adding new stuff to it and everything, and the Ark Encounter is also great as well. So, is there any actual evidence for this? Well, I remember when I was in about sixth grade or so, and my teacher was talking to us in science class about dinosaurs and whatnot, and she basically said, well, dinosaurs lived millions and millions of years ago, right? And dinosaurs and people did not live together. She made a comment about the Flintstones, and said, while it's a fun cartoon, it's not based in reality because dinosaurs and people are separated by millions of years and everything. But the problem is that according to the Bible, guess what? The Flintstones wasn't too far off <laughs> because dinosaurs and man lived together according to God's word. So let's look at some evidences outside of the Bible to see if there are actually any evidences for man living with dinosaurs or dragons. So the first thing we're going to do is look at some archaeological evidence. So looking at some archaeology. If anybody knows me, they know I love archaeology and everything. That's part, part of my master's degree dealt heavily in archaeology and whatnot. So archaeological evidence for man living with dinosaurs. So the first thing we're going to look at are some petroglyphs. So petroglyphs. Petroglyph is just a fancy word for a rock carving, all right? So it's basically somebody going in and just kind of tapping into the stone and making designs in the rock. That is what a petroglyph is. So we got a few examples of some petroglyphs that mostly Native Americans ended up creating here in, the, in what is now the United States. So the first one comes from National Bridges National Monument in Utah. This is a Native American petroglyph under the Kanchina Bridge in Utah. The original is up there, and it's kind of hard to see because it's been faded, but Answers in Genesis did a wonderful job in enhancing that. And what does that look like to you? Yeah, I mean, it, it looks a lot like this guy right here, right? Doing a little bit of shapes and stuff. So... Yeah, it looks just like a sauropod dinosaur. Again, one with long neck, long tail, whatnot. And however, the crazy thing is, do you think evolutionists go, hey, look, there's a dinosaur? No, unfortunately not. And they've actually tried to argue that this is not a sauropod dinosaur, but it's some type of snake-like petroglyph with some mud stains that are below it and whatnot. And they actually had people go up there and sit there and look at it, didn't do any testing, they just went and looked at it and said, oh no, this isn't true, this is not a dinosaur, and they had all these little drawings and stuff trying to show that it is not actually what, the, what it's claimed to be, and it's actually quite, quite absurd in how they actually do it. But the crazy thing is, again, like I said, there's no test, and again, it's based solely on observation, looking at it at the surface level and even just looking at it however though I mean even the original you can tell that you know that is supposed to be a dinosaur right I mean it's pretty crazy 
So the way that they interpret this, I mean, it, they're just interpreting it the way they want to interpret it without actually having any evidence to support their conclusions of trying to argue that, oh, no, this is not a dinosaur because people and dinosaurs could not possibly have lived together because dinosaurs lived millions and millions of years ago. So they, want, they don't want to interpret the glyph as such. So the next petroglyph we have, yes, I, I don't know if it's actually a part of, supposed to be a part of the petroglyph or not, I think, I mean, it's designed, but I honestly don't know what those lines at the top are supposed to represent, maybe wings, it might be just, you know, spears, <laughs> who knows, but the question is, how would they know how to draw these things if they didn't actually see them, right? And a lot of thing, and a lot of ideas. Well, they probably could have found the bones. We find bones. Well, they probably could have, but again, if those are spears or whatnot coming out of it, again, don't know. I don't really I haven't done that much research on it specifically. But I mean, just looking at it, you can tell it's a dinosaur. But at the same time, uh, how would they actually get? everything correct and again why would they show a hunting scene if that if those are spears again I'm not sure if they are or not it looks kind of like a wing to me but you know who knows I'm not going to make any definitive judgments on anything until unless you know proper information is given I don't like speculating a lot on various things so the next example we have here is from Wipa, Wipa, yeah, man, I can't pronounce that Wipa, what what Right, there you go, Wapataki, there you go, thank you. National Park near Flagstaff, Arizona. And some Native American languages are a little bit difficult. So here we have a petroglyph of what appears to be a fire-breathing dragon. I mean, it looks pretty much like what you see in medieval fairy tales and stuff of a dragon that breathes fire and everything. And the crazy thing is that around this petroglyph are petroglyphs of modern animals that we see every day around that area. So the question ends up coming, how, why do they draw a mythological animal next to a whole bunch of real ones? All right, see, this petroglyph, again, actually comes from around 1150 to 1300 A.D. They've dated it, and so it's around 1100, 1150 to 1300 A.D., and again, they basically, evolutionists try to claim that this is just a mythological, zoomorphic depiction and not a real animal. So they basically manipulated the drawing to make it look that way. It's not real. But like I said, why do they have all the real animals around it and then this one mythological animal? It doesn't make a lot of sense in that regard. So we have another petroglyph as well. This time we're going out of the southwest and into the northeast into Maine. So the Kennebec River at the Hagadon site near Emden, Maine has a petroglyph. I looked and looked and looked for a picture of this and for some unknown reason you can't hardly find one. You can't really find one. So might have to make a trip to Maine to go see if I can get a picture. <laughs> there we go. So I'm all about, I love, me and Callie love traveling when we're able to, but we haven't been able to travel too much, but hopefully more later. So do I? Yeah, I, I did. Yeah, I went to Mexico in the summer, but that was for research. But anyway, so this petroglyph that we have here in Maine, the depiction has a, a horned, long serpentine arrow-tailed dragon and it was made sometime around 900 to 1200 BC. So again it was made somewhere between 900 to 1200 BC and should really be 1200 to 900 because BC is flipped on the other way around. But again you have a horned long serpentine arrow-tailed dragon that is here at in Maine in Ebden, Maine. And as just as the one with in Arizona, you also have several modern animals surrounding it as well. So also, again, very similar depiction there. We have a lot of modern animals. 
And the crazy thing is, from the accounts that I've read about the pictograph, it actually it resembles a lot of European-style dragons. So dragons that the Europeans would draw their style, it looks about the same. So how would Native Americans in North America have the same drawing style as people in Europe? There's actually a Viking legend when the Vikings came over to North America and everything, because they actually predated Columbus quite, by quite a bit. Leif Erikson being one of the key people who came over here for the Vikings and established stuff in Canada. They met a lot of Native Americans, and they said that Native Americans actually spoke what, what sounded like Irish, old, old Irish. And so there may have been a lot more interconnectedness between the two hemispheres and what we were originally told. And I believe the world is a lot smaller even in ancient times than what everybody wants to admit because, well, they're just so far away. They're this or that. No, actually, people were a lot more connected than what everybody wants to try to imagine it. So the next petro, uh, petroglyph we have is actually comes from a place called Petroglyph Provincial Park. It's in Canada. And here we end up seeing various things, uh, carvings. So you have the, oh, Lord, that is a word for the Native American group. So I'm going to butcher this, and I apologize for anybody that's a part of this group if they ever see this. But uh, it's, it's spelled S-N-U-N-E-Y-M-U-X-W. Yeah. That's, that's why I'm, that's why Kevin can't say it. All right. So again, it's a First Nation group, and again, they carved various sea monsters and stuff into the rocks. And some of these monsters, they actually call them what we translate into sea wolves, because they have serpentine bodies with wolf-like heads. And again, if you look fairly closely at some of these right here, again. They kind of look like some of the depictions we saw last night, some of the marine reptiles that we had. So some people think they may be a little bit like the plesiosaurs. Some of them may be more like the giant alligator-looking ones, you know, the long mouth and stuff. So again, but you have the sea wolves here in Canada. Going back to the southwest, back to Utah, you have an area called Black Dragon Canyon where a pterosaur pictogram in Emory County, Utah is seen. So you actually have a pterosaur there. That's what you actually see. But if you actually enhance it a little bit, and again, I couldn't find answers in Genesis where they have the original and the enhancement, but there's a drawing. Somebody sat there and outlined it a little bit better so you could see it. And again, it looks just like a pterosaur, a flying reptile. But oh no, this isn't a pterosaur according to the evolutionists. It looks like one, but it ain't one. Again, even some creationists will actually argue this isn't a dinosaur or this isn't a pterosaur. And they say that, again, and they've come up with some pretty ludicrous alternatives using programs like Photoshop to sit there and try to show, oh, well, this isn't this, this is, you know, something else. Some examples of what they try to claim this is. So they try to claim it's a bug-eyed, oddly elongated person with a strange face, head, and snake. And they claim that around where the mouth looks like, it's supposed to be two arms outstretched or whatever. So, yeah, there's that. You also have a snake that doesn't look like a snake. <laughs> and, again, another person, again, like I said, that, had, that looks like they have fairy wings on its back. So, again, they claim that you have all these different things that kind of mesh together, and it's just, you know, really crazy. But the, one of the crazy things is, though, if you could actually get close to the petroglyph and zoom into it, where they claim that the arms are, where the mouth is, guess what? They have teeth on it. So tell me when in history man actually had barbs coming out of his arms, because that is not actually, you know, something that happens. 
We do, we do not have spikes, although it would be awesome. <laughs> Nobody walks around looking naturally like Shredder. I mean, off of the Ninja Turtles. All right, so the next petroglyph, again, one, again, I really would like to go to the Grand Canyon. It's a wonderful, it looks a wonderful place. It's also a good place for a lot of information about the flood and various things as well. But the Grand Canyon, there's also a petroglyph of what appears to be a dinosaur and to give kind of a little bit of reference here's an artist's illustration of the possible of dinosaur this is a dinosaur that we know is a real dinosaur and that petroglyph looks awful like it i mean pre pretty good the petroglyphs yes a lot of them have been dated like i said the one in maine was from like 1200 to 900 bc the first one I looked at was about 1100 to 1300 A.D. These ones here I didn't actually have, uh, in the research I did, I couldn't actually find dates for them. But the interesting thing about this one right here is that somebody actually used it for target practice. If you look down here at the base of the tail, you see a little spot. Somebody actually used it for target practice and shot a gun into it. Or shot a bullet into it with a gun. Didn't really shoot a gun into it, but shot a bullet into it with a gun. And the chipping that was caused by that shows that the markings of the drawing are extremely old because you can see where the modern chip is versus the discoloration of the of the carving itself and therefore that ends up showing that this is extremely old glyph that it's not modern by any means so it's not a hoax so Let's see here. You also have the Dhoni Scientific Expedition report about this petroglyph. It states that the fact that some prehistoric man made a pictograph of a dinosaur on the walls of this canyon upsets completely all of our theories regarding the antiquity of man. This is a report that came out in, again, this is on page five. This came out in 1924 when they discovered this picture, uh, this pictograph or petroglyph there we go the petro petroglyph they discovered this back in the late 1800s it was finally documented in 1924 and they made a report about it and again it said that because this is on here and we see this a man made this it really ends up upsetting our ideas about how old man really is or how old the dinosaurs are because they even then at that point they knew it was a dinosaur the original people who discovered it and looked at it so we have all these petroglyphs around in North America but what about other parts of the world well let's look at some depictions on monuments we're still looking at again archaeological evidences but we have some depictions on monuments of what would end up being looking like things that are called dinosaurs. So down in Cambodia, which is in Southeast Asia, kind of around Vietnam and all that area. So we have this carving into the wall of the sanctuary. So these are the ruins of Angkor outside of Siam Reap, uh, Cambodia. And that looks awful lot like a stegosaurus. But, oh no, that's not a stegosaurus according to evolution. That's just a hyper-visualized, you know, something or another. But a lot of creationists have used this for a long time. They have a stegosaurus right here along with many, uh, many modern animals that we see every day and everything. So, again, you actually have that above it and below it are animals that you can still find in Southeast Asia today. So, again, why would you have something that's not real with things that are real and also why would you have all the other stuff are hyper or not really hyper realistic but you can tell what it is right, very easily by looking at it. they're not changed anyway but all of a sudden you have this one that's changed quite a bit so why do you have one that's you know been morphed and altered to give it a different appearance versus the other animals where you can tell what they are again this is in all accounts, a stegosaurus that they probably saw and they carved into their temple here in Cambodia. So we have this. Again, it looks like a stegosaurus. But we also have in 
England and the United Kingdom, actually, have Bishop Bell's tomb in Carlisle Cathedral at the United Kingdom. And on that tomb, uh, sealed in the floor, you have a bronze seal on there. And right there in the middle of it, along with depictions of other animals, you have two sauropod dinosaurs that are put in there. And that's about the best picture I could find, but you can pretty much tell what they are pretty easily. But again, they look like sauropod dinosaurs. And again, the evolutionists usually try to say, oh no, those are just, you know, an anthropomorphic animals. They manipulated it, this and that. Well, looks a little bit too close to this to argue with, you know, at least to me. So anybody remember King Nebuchadnezzar? Yep, Nebuchadnezzar II, Book of Daniel. Everything, king of Babylon, he ends up building what is known as the Ishtar Gate. Anybody ever heard of the Ishtar Gate? It's a great big gate that allows you to go into Babylon. It's with this really bright blue glaze, and it has all sorts of different animals on there. Most people tend to note the lions that are on there because they you know, play a dominant role. But also on the Ishtar Gate, you have this animal right here that has an elongated body. You can actually see scales on it. it. has a serpentine tongue and everything, long tail. And again, it looks like a possibility of some type of dragon or dinosaur from Babylon. So again, it looks mostly like a dinosaur or a dragon. We also have other artistic representations of dinosaurs and I did not realize representations went off the grid like that whenever I did this my apologies so we have other artistic repetitio ends of dinosaurs all right so the first place we're going to go we're actually going to go down to South America so we're going to go down to South America to Peru which is on my bucket list so in Peru, you have representations of dragons and all sorts of different pottery and all sorts of vessels. So that one thing over here, that's actually a trumpet that they could blow into to make noises with. These two things are basically pottery vessels. They're decorated, again, with dragon themes. And Peru has so many dragon themes and motifs throughout all of its culture in the mochi period, which it actually predates the Inca. It's like one of the original uh, civilizations within Peru. They have so many dragon representations, it'd be kind of hard to think that they just did this just because they thought dragons were, you know, myth, but that they probably saw a lot of them around where they were. So you also have dinosaurs found in Egypt. So you also have dinosaurs you can see in Egypt. There's actually these slates, these slates right here that have look like sauropod dinosaurs again with very long necks. Now the necks are a little bit stylized as they are bending back and forth and snaking up. But again, they do look like sauropod dinosaurs. And you can really tell it here with the bodies and stuff of these animals down there at the bottom. But I don't know, these are not dinosaurs. These are just anthropomorphic, zoomorphic snakes or stuff like that. Lizards with very stylized necks. But again, it looks too much like this to really be argued against it. Then we go to Australia. The Australians have a picked have a artist or representation of a pleliosaur. You can actually find this in some of their carvings and paintings and such. And so here you have them, the Aborigines are hunting this pleliosaur, and they have a name for it. Let's see if I wrote it down. I did not. But they have a name for it, but, anyway, but they are hunting it down because if you look in the middle there, it has eaten one of their friends. So they're actually chasing it down and trying to kill it. And this is part of a legend that they have. But again, it looks a lot like a pleliosaur, a marine reptile. Well, we're going to get to that. Huh? 
We're going to get there. Yeah, y'all getting ahead of me. Y'all be patient. The Bible says patience. Come on, man. So, the Bible says you're supposed to have some patience and long suffering. Bear with me. All right. So, but again, the Aborigines drew this. And again, if that's a mythological creature, then they did a very good job of making it look like a real animal that we have fossils of. And we can sit there and say, that looks like a paleosaur. So, also, anybody know who Leonardo da Vinci is? All right, so can one of the kids tell me what one painting that he ended up painting that's very famous? That is correct, even though your dad told you. All right. <laughs> it, you want to come grab a prize? Yeah, ask, ask, ask your daddy what he wants. So Leonardo da Vinci drew a lot of stuff, painted a lot of things. So, no, no, it's the other one over there. It's this one right here, dear. Yes. All right. So again, da Vinci painted a lot of stuff. Mona Lisa is one of his most famous, although that painting's only about yay big. It's very small. But Last Supper, various other things that he ends up painting. But one of the things that he liked to do a lot of times is sketch a whole lot of stuff. And here in a folio we have from Da Vinci, you have him drawing cats as, he, as they're playing around doing various things. You have not only, uh, you not only have domestic cats, you also have a lion tucked away in there. But right in the middle, can anybody see that? Well, let me blow it up for you a little bit. Right in the middle of all those cats and a lion, you have him drawing what appears to be a dragon or a dinosaur. And again, looking like a sauropod dinosaur. So, the yeah, question was, was Da Vinci just having fun or was he actually drawing something that he actually saw? And a lot of people say, well, he's just drawing something that is out of myth and stuff because Da Vinci did draw and paint a lot of things that are out of the Greek myths and stuff like that. And yes, he did. He actually did. But you could actually tell by the context of those that they were from Greek myths. For instance, he, painted, he did a wonderful drawing of Poseidon being pulled by, you know, giant seahorses and stuff like that with his chariot and oversized creatures and whatnot that are from Greek mythology. However, the whole scene, you can tell that's what it was. In these sketchings, Da Vinci is just simply practicing movement and everything and whatnot. So why would he all of a sudden try to draw something that's mythological when he's practicing and trying to increase his skills on the movement of animals and such in this folio? It doesn't make sense. And so what makes more sense is he probably saw this dragon while he was working with the cats or whatnot and decided to sketch it out a little bit to get some of the movement that he saw from it. So we also have the Chinese calendar. The Chinese calendar. Anybody who's ever been to a Chinese restaurant knows what the Chinese calendar is all about. Every, all every year they have different animals representing different years and it cycles through. I was born in the year of the tiger, by the way. I made sure I looked that up whenever I was there. But if you look on the Chinese calendar, you have all these real modern animals and stuff, and then all of a sudden you have a dragon. Do what? Oh, we are in the year of the dragon. Wow, thank you, my good researcher over there. So, yeah, so... Why would the Chinese have a calendar where you have all these real animals, and then all of a sudden you have a mythological animal tucked away? And they even have a year of the rat, y'all. I mean, come on. You think they might have started having to stretch it just a little bit to have to include a rat? I mean, but what? If you have all these real animals, why, why would the dragon be fake? Why would it be myth? 
In fact, dragons in China are depicted all over the place. Anybody ever seen a Chinese New Year's celebration? You have all sorts of dragon imagery and this and that all throughout there with it. So now let's get it off of the archaeology and let's look at some accounts that we actually have of dragons with people. They actually have some actual historical accounts of people mentioning and seeing dragons. So the first account we have here is from Alien and or Alien. It's from around 220 AD. And it says, but according to accounts from Phaegra, there are dracones in Phaegra too. And these grow to a length of 60 feet. So dracones, it would be an old, old English word for dragon, of course. So in Phaegra, they're saying that they have dragons there that grow up to 60 feet. Phaegra is, I believe, kind of close to the Middle East. It's somewhere around in the Mediterranean. And so they claim they have dragons there that are 60 feet long. That's a big animal. So Pliny ends up stating that in his natural history that Africa produces elephants, but it is India that produces the largest elephants as well as the dragon. So Pliny, when he's writing a natural history book and talking about all the different animals from all different places, he talks about India having dragons. Uh, well, you got plenty of the elder, and then you got plenty of the younger. And according from what I got here, I'm not sure which one this is. I think this is the elder. The younger, I think, ends up living, you know, about another 50 years into the future. So, but again, so you got plenty here with this natural history. Again, talking about dragons alongside elephants. Again, why would you talk about one thing that's real, and then the next thing is a myth, and talking like it's real? So another account here from Marcus Tutilius Caesar, or Caesar from about 45 B.C. He said, even the Egyptians, whom we laugh at, deified animals solely on the score of some utility which they derived from them. For instance, the ibis being a tall bird with stiff legs and a long horny beak destroys a great quantity of snakes. It protects Egypt from plague by killing and eating the flying serpents that are brought from the Libyan desert by the southwest wind and so preventing them from harming the natives by their bite when alive and their stench when dead. So here we have an account that the Egyptians liked this bird because it attacked flying serpents. Huh? Now he is a Roman. So again, his name is Marcus Tutilius Caesar. It ain't, and it's not spelled like Caesar. C C I C E R. So I'm thinking of Caesar. But again, they've had some type of probably pterosaur that they were having to deal with. The Egyptians were. And here's another account for about Egypt as well with these same things. So among Egyptian birds, the variety of which is countless, the ibis is sacred, harmless, and beloved for the reason that by carrying the eggs of serpents to its nestlings for food, it destroys and makes fewer of those destructive pests. These same birds meet winged armies of snakes which issue from the marches of Arabia, producing deadly poisons, before they leave their own lands. So the Ibis is able to, again, attack, what, flying snakes, <laughs> winged snakes. Again, that would probably, again, be pterosaurs, or maybe even a type of pterosaur we don't know yet. If it looks more like an elongated snake with wings, then it might not, it's not necessarily looking like this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, we, so we end up seeing this uh, uh, results in Egypt time and again about them being plagued by these flying serpents, by these flying reptiles. So Aristotle, 
in his History of Animals in Book 9 states, The dragon, when it eats fruit, swallows endive juice. It has been seen in the act. So Aristotle, when he's writing a book on the history of animals, in book 9 he actually states that people have seen a dragon eating fruit and drinking endive juice from the fruit. They have actually seen them doing these things. How can you see something if it's not real? And it's, it's an imaginary friend, right? Marco Polo. Anybody ever played Marco Polo in the pool as a kid? Marco. Polo. All right. So the man, not the game, right? He was a real guy who traveled to China for the Catholic Church. And he actually brought back this spaghetti noodle from China. China came up with the noodle, and he brought it back. I always tell everybody, pasta is not Italian. It's part Chinese, part North American, part Indian and Indonesian because all the stuff that they use, except for probably the hamburger meat, came from other places. The tomato came from North America, the noodle came from China, spices came from India and Indonesia. Well, I can't have any, can't have it without all those things. The Italians stole a lot of stuff to make their food. I tell you, but Marco Polo, while he was in China, in his accounts, he states that he saw the emperor of China being pulled in a chariot. And dragons were pulling that chariot. And I, don't, and I don't care who you are, that's actually pretty neat. If I had the chance to have dinosaurs or dragons pulling my chariot, guess what, I'd be doing the same thing, all right? Because it shows how much power you have, but also just something really cool to have done. So again, Marco Polo saw dragons pulling the emperor of China's chariot while he was in China. So you also have the Epic of Gilgamesh. Anybody heard of the Epic of Gilgamesh? So it's a Babylonian tale, a Mesopotamian tale of this guy named Gilgamesh who is trying to, he's a great big hero. And part of it, he actually tries to find immortality. And he actually goes and seeks after this one guy. I can't remember the Babylonian name for him. Do what? No, that's the name of the god. But anyway, it's about this long. But anyway, it actually equates to Noah. And he's trying to figure out what happened. Long, how did he have that long life? Because he's wanting to be immortal as well. And you actually have a flood account in there, the Epic of Gilgamesh. It talks about a global flood that destroyed everything. And him and his wife were the only ones that survived with animals. So Gilgamesh in that epic is said to have killed a dragon. Is that what? Yeah, there you go. So, but again, Gilgamesh is said to have killed a dragon in that epic, whatnot. And a lot of people argue, well, Gilgamesh is a fictional character. It's part of an epic poem. It's not real. Well, if the flood account sounds a lot like the Genesis flood and everything, I imagine some of these things are probably more real than others. I like to argue that I believe Gilgamesh is actually Nimrod out of Genesis, the founder of Babel and the builder of the Tower of Babel. But, again, there's a little bit more that needs to be done there, but there, I'm not the only one. There's a lot of people who equate Gilgamesh with Nimrod. There's also a Chinese legend of you. It's a Chinese legend of you, not me. And so this Chinese legend of a guy named you. That won't be confusing. So after a great flood, Yu ends up surviving, and he ends up going to survey the land of China. When he gets to China and everything, he actually starts draining off the waters. He builds a lot of channels to drain the water to the sea to try to clear off some of the land. And he ends up making the land livable once again for people. And the flood here, by the way, the great flood they're talking about was a universal flood as well. So imagine that. But as he is making this land livable for farmland and stuff where people can come settle or whatnot, he is also able to drive many snakes and dragons to, away from the marshlands that he's clearing out when it ends up being turned into farmland. So 
So he gets rid of a lot of snakes as well as dragons in this legend from the Chinese. And again, some of this sounds a little bit like what could happen post-flood from the Bible as people are trying to make everything uh, livable again. And at the Creation Museum, you can also end up seeing various things about these type of things as well. Here's a plaque of the Lyrenian Hydra. According to Greek mythology, Hercules performed 12 labors, including a battle with a great creature known as the Hydra. The serpentine dragon had nine heads. Of course, it's probably not actually real, but again, it is interesting about how they would depict the Hydra in this and it does sound a little bit like a dinosaur dragon minus you know having all the extra heads or the ability to regrow heads although some lizards if you cut off its tail what happens it grows back mm. you also have the red dragon of whales there are many tales described that describe how yeah the red dragon came to be closely associated with whales one popular story tells of an epic battle between a red dragon and a white dragon in which the red dragon saved the people of the land by defeating the white dragon. And if you ever see anything from the area of Wales in the UK, they have a lot of red dragon imagery. And that's actually where I'm uh, getting my masters from is in Wales. And even on the school's logo, you actually have a dragon on there still today. You also have in Mesoamerica, in Central America and Mexico, you have the tale of Quetzalcoatl, who's a feathered serpent. Oh, there you go. There's your feathered dinosaur. But again, they worship him as being the god of the wind and the morning and evening stars. Quetzalcoatl is seen as a big hero to the Mesoamerican people as he is one that introduced maize to them and other things to where they could actually survive. And they say that he comes in after a great flood and teaches them how to rebuild civilization and stuff as well. And I'd almost also argue that Quetzalcoatl is just a reimagination of Nimrod as well. So you also have John of Damascus. He was an 8th century scholar, again, who wrote on dragons and ghosts in which he differentiated between real creatures and fictional creatures. After describing some dragons as extremely large serpents, he states, There is one more kind of dragon, those that have a wide head, goldish eyes, and horny protuberances on the back of the head. They also have a beard protruding out of the throat, this dragon is a sort of beast like the rest of the animals, for it, is, for it has a beard like a goat and horn at the back of its head. Its eyes are big and goldish. These dragons can be both big and small. All serpent kinds are poisonous except dragons, for they do not emit poison. So again, he actually talks about fictional animals and real animals, but here he's actually talking about the dragons as if they are real. So if he's actually differentiating between fictional and real animals, and he talks about the dragon as if it's a real animal, then why is it not a real animal that they saw and were around? You also have Athanasius Kircher, who is around 1600, and has been called a polymath, which is a person with encyclopedic learning. In his exhaustive study of everything underground, uh, Mundus Subterraneus, Kircher included a chapter on dragons. So he actually included a chapter in his learning about dragons. Describing multiple dragon artifacts and legendary encounters with the beasts, he, uh, he, sorry, he covered the dragon like any other animal in his book, citing their dwellings, often caves and habitats. So here's a quote from that of winged dragons. Dispute has only arisen between authors, most of whom declare them to be fanciful. But these authors are contradicted by the histor histories and eyewitnesses. Winged dragons, small, great and greatest, have been produced in all times in every land. 
So he's saying that by 1600, people are starting to think dragons are nothing more than legend and myth. But he's like, no, no, if you actually go through and look at all histories and eyewitness accounts, there's people all over the place that say they've seen dragons everywhere. And so they cannot be fake. They have to be real animals. So they also have Romans. Actually have an account with dragons also. Ancient Roman historians wrote about dragons, treating them as real creatures. Cassius Dio tells of an encounter said to have taken place in the 3rd century B.C. involving the Roman general Marcus Attilius Regilius who served during the First Punic War. It is reported that his army battled a dragon while they were fighting the First Punic War against the Carthaginians. And he also has several Roman writers talking about various other things as well, dealing with dragons. In England, you have this legend of St. George and the dragon. St. George, who lived around 275 to 300, was a devout Christian and Roman military officer. The famous legend of his battle with the dragon is said to have occurred during his journey to join his men in Diocletian's army. As he neared the city of Selene in Libya, he saw a young princess outside the city wall. She pleaded with him to leave so that he would not be killed by the dragon to which she was being offered as a sacrifice. George refused and vowed to protect her. He actually killed the dragon, whatnot. And the description that they end up giving of the dragon in the account actually looks like a dinosaur that they have found fossils of in the area. So the description of, of Saint, Legend of St. George here with the dragon sounds, again, that dragon depiction looks a lot like fossils they found of dinosaurs in that region around Libya. There's also an Anglo-Saxon Chronicle of 793 A.D. that tells of fiery dragons flying across the firmament. For, so they have fiery flying dragons flying in the sky in around 800 A.D. Alexander the Great. We, uh, we know Alexander the Great, hopefully, right? Macedonian guy. So he ends up reporting in 326 B.C. that his soldiers who were fighting in India were afraid of the great dragons that lived in the caves. So he ends up writing in some of his works that his soldiers, as they were fighting through India, they started being very afraid because they were encountering dragons in the caves of India. Again, why would they be afraid of nothing? Yeah, there's something there. So... The problem is, is that, again, you have dragon legends, dragon iconography, all these reptiles all over the planet from people. Well, how do evolutionists, you know, get over this? How do they end up coming up with this? Well, a guy by the name of Carl Sagan. Anybody ever heard of Carl Sagan? He ended up doing the first Cosmos series on TV back in the 80s. He ends up writing a book called The Dragons of Eden where he's trying to explain why there are so many dragon legends all over the earth. And in his book, he comes up with this wild idea of how this has happened. Because he states that millions and millions of years ago, while the dinosaurs roamed the earth, small mammal-like creatures that would eventually end up returning into the precursors of people or whatnot, encountered these giant dinosaur beasts and whatnot. And they are so terrifying and so scary that these images and everything just embedded themselves into the memory of these animals, so much so that apparently it made it into its genetic code because that's the only thing that passes down from one thing to another. And so people, as they got uh, millions of years later, as humans evolved or whatnot, then all of a sudden while they were asleep, their subconscious was reliving those things from way millions of years ago and seeing these great beasts and when they woke up, they started writing about it, drawing them, painting them, designing stuff, etc., etc., and everything. And boy, is that a lot to, of a complicated situation there. Again, it's amazing the lengths people are willing to go through to deny what's right in front of them. And again, why do they go through these lengths? Because they don't want it to be true. They do not want there to be a God, so they try to do what they can to deny God. And 
So we have all this, and again, the crazy thing is the truth is always simpler than a lie. Lies usually have to be a lot more complex in order to get to the truth. If the truth is complicated, then it's how true can it really be. Now, it can be technical, but it should not be complicated, right? And so again, as Occam razors go, right, the simplest solution is the best solution. The best and the simplest solution is what? People lived with dinosaurs. So we also have modern dinosaur sightings as well, not just from ancient times, but there are also modern dinosaur sightings. And a lot of these come out of Africa. Uh, in Africa, you have the Mokele Mbeme, which translates into the blocker of rivers. And this creature is seen in Africa by a lot of the native people. They talk about it. I have a very long quote here. From a 1983 scientific expedition that was led by university trained biologist Marcillian Aganea, who made this observation while he was on this tour in Africa as they were looking for different animals. And they're actually searching for this animal in particular. So at approximately 2.30 p.m., we were then able to observe a strange animal with a wide back, a long neck, and a small head. The animal was located about 300 meters from the edge of the lake, and we were able to advance about 60 meters in the shallow water, placing us at a distance of about 240 meters from the animal, closer than I want to be which had become aware of our presence and was looking around as if to determine the source of the noise. Deconomobo, a local villager, continued to shout with fear. The frontal part of the animal was brown, where the back part of the neck appeared black and shone in the sunlight. The animal partly submerged and remained visible for 20 minutes with only the neck and head above the water. It then submerged completely. No further sighting of the animal took place. It can be said with certainty that the animal we saw was the Mokele Mbembe, that it was quite alive, and furthermore, that it is known to many inhabitants of the Lake Likulala region, an area of swampland about the same size as Florida. Its total length from head to back visible above the water line was estimated at five meters. So we have this eyewitness account from the 1980s of seeing this creature in Africa. All the locals in this area talk about this river and they've seen this animal time and time again. It's not like it's you know, a one offer. The locals there see it quite a bit. And we actually end up having headlines coming from earlier in the century as well, in the early 1900s, talking about the possibility of dinosaurs being in Africa. So is, is a brontosaurus roaming Africa's wilds? That comes out of the New York Herald in 1910. There could be dinosaurs still alive in Africa, Saturday Evening Post. Evolutionists tended to throw these headlines away, saying that, oh, there's just dinosaur mania in the early 1900s, Everybody's finding dinosaurs. They were thinking they saw a dinosaur here or there. But Africa has actually been well known to have a lot of dinosaur sightings. And again, the local people claim to see these animals quite a bit. A well-known South African big game hunter, Mr. F. Gobbler, returned from a trip to Angola and announced to the Cape Town newspaper, the Cape Argus, there was an animal of large dimensions, the description of which could only fit a dinosaur dwelling in the Delolo swamps, and known to the natives as the Chipikwe, it has the head and tail of a lizard. Everything. So again, this comes from 1948 as well. So we have a lot of these things going on here, but what about some other, thing, other sightings? Well, has anybody ever heard of the Loch Ness Monster? Yeah, Loch Ness Monster, looks a little, the descriptions look a lot like a paleosaur. But Loch Ness Monster is not the only one that we find. In fact, if you go to Scotland and everything, there are seven other lakes around Loch Ness that have monster sightings as well. Loch Ness just happens to be the most famous one. Well, how come no one has any video or pictures of stuff or whatever? Can you, are you going to be 100% prepared to find this thing? 
And tell you, you can't actually go down in Loch Ness. It's actually very murky. It's super dark. Even with the brightest lights, you still can't see anything. Well, now it's also very deep, and there's a whole lot of caves underneath. So guess what? If the if there is a plesiosaur down there, guess what? It has plenty of areas where it can go and hide for long periods of time. It does not have to surface like what we would think it would. So you also have in the Morgarwar, which is a Cornish sea serpent. It is witness. The witnesses that saw the Cornish sea serpent state that it had a long neck and black or brown skin, kind of like a sea lion. You also have Ogopogo in, in the Okanagua Lake in British Columbia, Canada. Again, Ogopogo is described similar as Nessie, kind of like a pleliosaur. You also have Champ in Lake Champlain in Vermont. Again, looks a lot like Nessie, sounds like a pleliosaur. And a lot of these areas, again, end up really pushing this idea of their lake monster or lake creature that they have. The last thing we're going to look at here is an account in the late 1800s. So in, on April 26, 1890, the Tombstone Epitaph newspaper printed the following incredible report. And everything, it's kind of hard to read there, so I got my notes right here. So basically what happened... Yeah, two cowboys that saw a winged monster flying. It resembled a, a huge alligator with an extremely elongated tail and large wings in the desert. And this was between Whetstone and Huachuaca Mountains. Again, it, had only two it only had two feet, so it had two feet. And the head appeared to be about 8 feet, and it was about 160 feet from head to tail. The jaws had sharp teeth, and the eyes were as big as dinner plates, and the wings were made of membrane, so skin, not feathers. He had two cowboys that got close enough as they could to the creature, and they began opening fire on it, shooting it with their rifles. They claimed to have killed it. And again, this sounds like a pterosaur. You actually have people who've photoshopped pictures of a pterodactyl or a pterosaur with a bunch of cowboys and stuff. That picture is not real. That, there is no actual picture in the news article. There's no photograph of it. So don't be fooled by people trying to do you know silly things with stuff on the internet. But again, the original post did not actually have any pictures or never any pictures of it, but the account Again, it sounds a lot like a pterosaur, as we see over here, and that they possibly did actually kill this creature out in the west. So, again, there are many, many sightings. There are many different things and evidences to show that, what, dinosaurs lived with people. The dragons are dinosaurs, and again, that they lived alongside man. And we expect nothing less since God created us on day, day six.